this meeting is being live streamed. There's no voice now. Did you turn it off? No, I didn't touch it. You didn't touch it. A likely story. Mm -hmm. I'm just uh, playing with my virtual background now. This is an artist rendition of a fancy fantasy city um, that I found on the internet. Nice, I like it. Thanks. Oh, damn it, I need to get water. Ugh. Go get water. All right. <laughs> it's chill, we'll chill. We'll wait for you to get some water. Gotta get the water. All right, what I miss? Well, I sang a little song to myself and uh, drank some water. Okay, cool. That was about it. Sounds amazing. Hold on, just get my second screen. All right. All right. So last time we talked about what we wanted to talk about tonight. We were basically, the theme is highlighting solutions, climate solutions, because the last couple times we talked about, um, last time was, why is it so difficult to talk about climate in general? Why is it so difficult to talk about the climate crisis, climate change, whatever? And the gist from that overall conversation was, you know, um, I think people are just numb from the, the doomism. There's this psychological numbing that we do to uh, just keep going about our day because what else can you do, right? So when we talk about the potential that we have to design a better world, um, it's much easier to talk about climate in that angle or from that angle and the time we talked, not last week, but the week before, I think, we talked about um, how the media coverage of, of climate is leading a lot of people to feeling a lot of climate anxiety and um, apathy and nihilism. And the reason is because the media doesn't talk about solutions. The media just describes the um, crisis, the upcoming crisis that's coming and how bad it's going to be and, and leaves it at that. And we talked a lot about a lot of reasons why that happens. Um, but anyway, the both of those episodes kind of talked about how we really need to be talking about solutions because that wouldn't make people feel so anxious and nihilist. And so why don't we come on here and talk about some solutions? <laughs> in a nutshell right yeah definitely definitely yeah so um i think another uh reason for us wanting to to switch to this particular topic too i'm in the middle of um of putting together my class project so i'm teaching a climate designers class at cca it's my third time teaching it and um shout out to my chair rachel berger who greenlit the class before I even wrote up a description. She just trusted me and thought it was going to be a cool idea a few years ago. Um, this is when we started Climate Designers. <clears throat> so um, it's been a really fun class to kind of prototype and test out stuff and talk to younger people about the topic, obviously. And um, 
And, you know, it's been taking a little bit to get going because I've never taught this class before and we're kind of building the bike as we ride it. But I'm really excited about this particular project, which will be a semester long project. We're about three weeks in already. And um, the first three weeks, we've been really just talking about climate science. We've been talking about, um, you know, capitalism and extraction and colonial worldviews. And, you know, I'm, I'm bringing them up to speed. Uh, you know, kind of a crash course, if you will. And um, and so tomorrow is when I, I reveal the project. And one of the things that we've been doing over the last uh, two, three classes has been, and then I guess this one tomorrow will be their fourth class on solutions. And so one of the things that we did early on uh, within the last couple of days in the solutions segment of the class, we watched the documentary 2040. Have you seen it yet, Sarah? You gave me the assignment to watch it as homework and I have failed. I get an okay. F. I have not watched it yet. I even have um, it loaded up in my browser to watch mm -hmm. and then I yeah. just don't. It's, you I have no excuse. Finish. I have yes, no you, excuse. You're, you've disappointed me as, <laughs> as you tend to do sometimes, JK. Um, no, I have a really hard time watching video. I know you do. I, I really it just, that. I don't know. It takes so much of my attention and I have ADHD and I can't just sit and focus on one thing. Sure, sure. I know. Um, <laughs> anyway, if you ever just get the desire to watch it, you definitely should. And I love the concept. Um, so for those who haven't seen it, I won't ruin the story, although it's a documentary, so whatever. Um, so yeah, this guy has a young daughter and he's concerned about the climate crisis and he starts to think about, well, wait a minute, what is this world going to look like in 2040 when my young daughter is, will be a young adult and he goes on this quest to talk to kids and scientists and researchers about what the world's going to look like if 2040 if the solutions of today are were actually implemented and he draws a lot of inspiration from project drawdown which i'm sure we all know um, if you haven't it's drawdown.org um, a couple years ago they put together a a, uh, a guide with current solutions that could actually really put a dent in our climate breakdown. And they categorized it in all these solutions into certain categories and made a beautiful book. And uh, it was a really big, um, kind of a, a, a big moment in this whole climate change space, I guess, if that's even a space, I don't know, man. Anyway, it was a really great book and it has been, and it's evolving now. And so we use Drawdown as, well, yeah, so the documentary focuses on that, on about five or six solutions. And the cool thing about it is that every solution that he does a deep dive in, there's about a three minute, um, three minute uh, little segment of the world in 2040. And it's very much like what you have in your background, Sarah, you know, it's like, beautiful thriving you know gardens and you know electric vehicles and whatever and and uh, he does a deep dive of that solution for a few minutes and then he goes back to 2019 or 2017 I think that was when it was made and then he just does it again with another solution anyway very positive very hopeful and the cool thing about it is that yeah these are all solutions that exist today you know we don't need another breakthrough we don't need to wait until we find that one big you know solution it's like we have them in front of us let's fucking do it you know let's put some money and, and attention so with that um along the same uh time their assignment was to visualize a world in 2040 what does their world look like and so they did that they had about a week to do it a lot of, of students did you know, animation, stop motion, video, things like that. It was really fun to see their creativity. One guy did it in VR, which is pretty interesting. Wow. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, we've been talking just a lot about what does that world look like? Or, you know, let's look into these solutions. We don't need any new ones. And so they've been doing some research with Drawdown and some other sites that I gave them. And then so tomorrow is the big reveal of the project. And so should I just read? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going to read out loud. Is that cool? Yeah, because I was working on it right before this call. Um, okay, so this is what I'm going to have on the presentation, more or less, you have the opportunity to share one of the many current solutions being developed that addresses our climate emergency. How might we promote these solutions to become become widespread, adopted and funded? Success is a future world 
that success is a future world where ecosystems are repaired and all living species thrive in harmony with our natural world. So that's their project brief. And then I get into various things. What does it mean to promote it? What, what does it mean to be, you know, have it be widespread, adopted, funded? Yeah, like we're gonna be covering guerrilla marketing, shifting paradigms, culture jamming, narratives, behavior science, pop culture. Um, and what they're gonna do is they're gonna combine their personal interests, which, which was another early assignment with a solution from drawdown. And then they're gonna form teams around those personal interests and solutions that they're interested in. So you might have some students who are interested in farming or oceans or whatever, then they're gonna self-select. And then the whole prompt is, how do we get these solutions today out there? Like the thing is, is that we don't know these solutions exist because no one's talking about them. So how can we get people to rally around everyday people to rally around these solutions so that we can demand them to be adopted and funded, that we can demand our politicians and people at the top to actually realize, hey, we want this. Why, you work for us, Mr. Mrs. Politician person. We, we want this, you need to do something about it. Because I just feel like the drawdown solutions are in our, in our little community, but like my family doesn't know about these solutions. I'm sure your family doesn't, you know? Like, why are we not highlighting these to make these solutions be the most, and I'm not, I don't want the students to focus on companies themselves. This is not like a, a pro bono spec work thing. It's more about the, the the solution space, how, and then highlighting, yes, yeah, sure, a few companies, but um, yeah, why are we not uh, highlighting awesome people doing great stuff and then demanding this stuff to actually happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so can you make this a little bit more concrete for me? And since I haven't even seen the film, I am familiar with Drawdown, but maybe some of the viewers aren't even familiar with that. Maybe um, you, like off the top of your head, you can share one or two of the solutions to start. From the documentary? Yeah. Yeah. From 2040. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Man, there's so many. Um, you know, they, they, with their like CGI magic, you know, they transform, you know, highways into gardens right um, mm. or, or parking lots that are going to be empty because we're going to have less car ownership into community gardens or affordable housing right um man what else did they do uh i've seen it twice already and i can't remember <laughs> um, all right well no so, let's go with that so one they, so like yeah yeah let's talk about um highway highways and mm -hmm. parking lots as community gardens so you're imagining a world where we have way fewer cars especially in our cities and um, all that empty space is now reclaimed for community gardens. So as a student or as a designer um, doing this project, if I picked that one, mm -hmm. what, what would be my, my project? Yeah, so you would want to do research on, um, you know, the benefits of or when, you know, the, the idea of kind of um, electric vehicles autonomous electric vehicles become more of a thing because we'll have less cars on the road because we'll have it'll be car on demand basically you know service as a car as a service as what tony sipa says um so you know just like is that the most viable is that the quickest or is that the one of the th the things that we should put a lot more attention towards and then from there you know think about who might want to know about this stuff to demand that we put more research into that solution. Um, and then the other, the other cool thing that I, I want to have focus on this project, have them focus on is it's not so much getting people aware that these things exist. It's, and maybe this will kind of uh, round out, I think your point, the point that you're trying to make. I, I want them, I want these projects to encourage people who work in the more traditional extractive industries and companies to hopefully quit their job and and say hey i want to work for that company who's doing that kind of stuff because all these companies are creating new uh, industries and these industries are creating ecosystems we need people to work in those industries and within those ecosystems so th these are the green jobs that everyone's been talking about, right? How come we're not making that connection? It's like, sure, you can tell people, hey, go and, and work for solar 
a panel company or go and you know work for this company. But if you're not showing that vision of why they should and the work that they're going to be creating by doing that, then you might get hesitation of people wanting to transition from something that's comfortable. You know, oh, well, I don't want to do that. You know, I like my job. It's my it's been in my family for three years. It's, you know, I'm a family, you know, oil guy, whatever. Like, of course they're not going to transition easily, right? But if you can highlight these solutions in a way that makes them say, oh, wow, that is a feature that I want and that is doable and the solution does exist, then we get more people to transition into these more uh, green jobs. Because as much as we say we want them, we're not really talking about how to actually draw people into those jobs. Yeah, so I guess I'm still wondering as a designer, what do I, what's my project to do that? Like understanding a bit more about what um, the goal is, maybe like, I guess if I were a graphic designer, illustrator, mm -hmm. um, maybe I might want to make a poster or something. Like yeah, what, so, what am I doing? So breaking down the how might we statement. So let me read it again. How might we promote these solutions to become widespread, adopted, and funded? So what do I mean by promote? So get the public to rally around this amazing solution, share a vision of a future in which that, sol that solution exists. What do I mean by widespread? Get in front of as many people as possible, make that become the topic of conversation. Uh, Got about it. Adopted by our current economic system or by a new one, it doesn't matter. Fitting into our current lives, make it easy for them for, for these solutions to fit in our current lives changing behavior to adopt it quicker. And then funded could be a series of funding opportunities. Um, and so with all that, it could look like a number of things. It can look like here, I'm putting the keynote together as we speak, actually. <laughs> like like one of the first things that um, pops into my head is, is making a poster for some reason. Like, yeah, exactly. I kind of remember um, seeing an image of a World War II era mm -hmm. United States propaganda poster about victory gardens mm -hmm. where um, the government was actually very big on um, convincing citizens to plant a victory garden, which was mm -hmm. just like, you know, growing some vegetables in your yard. Um, and it worked like people actually everywhere had gardens. Mm -hmm. And in the Midwest, where my mother's family, my mother grew up and her brothers and sisters are still there and they still have gardens. Like she was just talking about her brother the other day has way more um, zucchini than he can use and it happens every year. And so he gives it out to all of his neighbors, you know, it's mm -hmm. awesome. Nice. Um, so just, I don't know, like a World War II era vintage style victory garden poster, but something more along the lines of um, making it more tangible and visual about like what it feels like to live in a world where we're exactly. surrounded by gardens instead of by concrete. Yeah. So that can look like a number of things. So like, you know, what's the 2021 version of that victory garden poster, you know, so tapping into, you know, music, art, photography, AR, VR, um, you know, what are the mediums that we, that we have today? Because again, if we're talking about solutions that exist today, we should also be talking about technology that exists today. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I was just telling you uh, uh, before we hit record, I was doing some research on Rihanna's um, Fenty and Savage show. So you can tell I'm just now learning this, <laughs> but like, you know, she's really, from what I've gathered, uh, she's really pushing the boundaries of fashion and this fashion show has now become a concert in a sense so she's using music and fashion as a as a medium to express her vision or mission of whatever it is that she's doing and so what i'm looking for like sure a website a poster a social media instagram graphic fine whatever those are like like the the nuts of the whole thing what's the the nuts and bolts what's the larger thing that we can create that those digital and analog design components are part of not that the focus is on those things it's the larger thing so another you know having them do research in the metaverse and having them um you know look into uh number wait, wait wait metaverse what what is the metaverse and why is it related to climate 
<laughs> it's not related to climate at all. I don't want to oh, okay. give them. I don't want to give them climate inspiration. <laughs> okay, I'm, cool. I want to give them this, like. Oh, okay, so culture. you're using Rihanna's um, fashion, fashion rock yep. show yep. as inspiration. Yeah, because what is that doing to her fans? What is that doing to the fashion industry? And as climate designers, how can we take inspiration from that? What are the, right. The it's making all of those things come together and work together like headlines get in the spotlight people yep. think it's cool yeah yeah yep. got yeah. it okay cool cool so yeah so this is not your typical design project and um <laughs> and you know me i'm very loose with my curriculum and so um they're gonna probably have tons of questions tomorrow but i'm gonna be like i don't know let's figure it out together you know like because this project brief that i'm giving them I don't think it's it's ever existed. I mean, I'm sure, but like you know, I don't have the answers either. So let's figure this out as we go because this is all new to us. So stay tuned. I'm super excited. I mean, we can get more into the project if you want, but yeah, um, it's gonna be. I think it's gonna be big. And one of the goals too. Let me read you the goals, and then we can move on if you want. Um, so some of the goals to uh, get this picked up by the news, whether it's uh, national news or international news um to get people to create a protest demanding this of you know in the next year uh and then have this be uh talked about um in on capitol hill uh in the next six months yeah so, you know that gives me an idea um if i were a writer if i were really good at coming up with catchy phrases and slogans. Um, if the specific idea that I wanted to promote was community gardens instead of parking lots, you know, finding some kind of a phrase in there and then making a um, campaign around that that would make it easy to, oh, I get it, I get it, you know? Yep. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I think I, I'm seeing Rachel Gulas here. Um, say hi to Rachel. Hi, Rachel, in the chat saying, um, Rihanna, yes, grateful for this example. And I think that we really learn by example, a lot of us, I do anyway. Um, so, you know, having like, that's why I keep kind of drawing out like concrete things and just being like, okay, mm -hmm. so that might be, yeah. you know, you might do it that way, you might do it this way. And just because I've done that in two different ways, hopefully that gets the, the the gears going on how you know you might do this in other ways too i guess sure sure yeah. yeah 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 and and as i mentioned just a few minutes ago i think looking at examples outside of the climate space i think is really important um i mean you and i have talked about this you know if if the environmental movement from the 70s were if it was successful we'd be in a very different place right now yep and for so many decades, we've been, uh, or the environmental movement space has been operating under best practices because that's what they've just always known. And at some point, we're starting, you know, someone is, is, is waking up and saying, wait a minute, well, this isn't working. <laughs> so maybe we should like change tactics. Yeah, exactly. And so that's what we're trying to do with climate designers and just all these different projects that we're trying to get off the ground. Um, yeah, and I want to like make even that statement a little bit more concrete too. Like, um, what the this isn't working is. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I'm trying to remember exactly which year. I think th th if you look at the smog crises, um, every industrialized city it seems like had a version or their own smog crises. Uh, you know, and I think in LA, it was in the 1930s or 40s. And it was basically everybody was getting cars. And the more cars that were on the road, the more smog was in the air. Mm -hmm. And um, it was so bad that people were getting sick and people were dying. So it was like an intense smog crisis. And, um, you know, I don't know exactly how it happened, but basically it was the science was revealed that, hey, you know, um, burning these, this, this gas creates toxic air pollutants. And 
then you get activists who are like, okay, um, let's clean up our air. And then you get politicians who, um, who didn't do anything about it until, I think it's important to get the timeline right. So it's been a while since I looked at this, so I apologize, but um, inventors came up with a more efficient engine that mm-hmm. it burned the same fuel, but it burned it more cleanly. Mm-hmm. So it was more efficient and it produced less air pollution. Um, once that was in place, then the politicians in California passed a law. Uh, I think it was one of the first country, uh, one of the first clean air act laws, legislations in Cal- the one in California was the first in the US um, that basically said all new cars need to switch over to this new style of engine. Mm-hmm. And the rest of the country basically used that as a template and it was adopted worldwide or countrywide. Um, And that's kind of the model that environmentalists have been going with to create change. So, you know, the science comes out and says, hey, this is a problem. Um, Activists come out and say, hey, do something about this problem. Uh, an inventor or a designer, because inventors and engineers and designers are basically all the same thing, um, comes up with a solution that works better. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And then politicians can act on the activists' demands because a solution exists. So the activists- Ideally, ideally. Yeah. (laughs) So the activists, you know, through the um, 70s, 80s, and 90s, just kept pushing that same button, basically, you know, like do something about this problem. And uh, there wasn't like a a solution that was easy enough for politicians to be like, okay, we're just gonna do that. Like we saw with the ozone, I don't know Mm -hmm. if people viewing this are old enough to remember, but um, science came out with this like huge, um, you (laughs) you think the climate crisis news is bad, Um, the ozone layer crisis news in what was it like the eighties or early nineties Yeah, was like, Oh my God, the ozone layer is disappearing. And it was all over the news and it was, it was all over. And, um, the culprit was mostly these chemicals that we were using in refrigerants and air conditioners and hairspray. I love that this happened in the eighties too, because everybody was using (laughs) aerosol, like Aquanet hairspray to get like big bangs. Like I remember I was trying to make my hair limp and straight and I was trying to make it have big bangs and, you know, like, I don't know, what was it like Def Leppard or whoever, like all of the hair bands were a thing and it was just a thing. And Aquanet, man. (laughs) Although I did, so I, did funny like their, to me. I did like the design of their bottles though, their <laughs> spray bottles. I think it was one of the first. I was like, a, uh, you know, I was a toddler kid in the 80s. So I, I remember that. Yeah. Two older sisters that just. It was a thing. Was and a then thing. you find out that, you know, obviously it wasn't hairspray that was causing the damage to the ozone. Um, but it was like the industrial yeah. uh, refrigerants. But also happened to be used in aerosol cans. So anyway, um, you know, and then the the governments came together and uh, it was the Montreal Protocol. Um, I might be getting my protocols confused, but um, there was a actual global ban on CFCs and HCFCs or whatever. Um, and um, yeah, the latest I heard about the ozone layers from NASA, it says that it's uh, well on its way to um, it's small. It's as small as it's ever been. The hole in, in the ozone, and it's well on its way to being completely restored. Is what I heard. So um, everybody expected that, you know, carbon emissions would follow mm-hmm. that same model. But um, what they didn't really expect was that there are other ways to influence politicians, <laughs> and it turns out appealing to uh, emotions and um, identity, like this will make you look cool or this will make you look tough and manly, um, was something that environmentalists 
didn't have in their playbook mm -hmm. and advertisers yeah. did. And yeah, so we're now in a situation where um, I think the most interesting thing that the environmental movement can do is take some of the moves from that playbook and start using those techniques of like, mm, this is the, good. this is the cool thing to do. This is the thing that will make you look smart or tough or um, whatever it is that whoever you're talking to is concerned about. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, why not take a, a page out of their playbook, you know, advertising and use it for good. I've always thought that way. It just for me, it always seemed like when I was in design school, there's always this like, with my classmates, oh, the ad, the ad kids, that's what we called them. You know, they're kind of in it for all the wrong reasons and they probably hated us too. I don't know what, I didn't really, I didn't really get into that. I had friends in both and I didn't really care. Although I did, I understand the power of advertising and the, you know, the shit that it's been getting us in, but I've always just found it as inspiration. And I remember when I was a young person and uh, getting, into the creative design field, even though it, I discovered it later in life, but I would always deconstruct like commercials. You know, what were they, what was the main character? What was the theme? What was the story? What were they talking about in terms of the product, whatever? And so um, I just always found advertising as inspiration. Yes, ignoring, but also acknowledging what it's been doing to the planet and to people. But again, what can we use you know, as inspiration from their playbook to then apply for good. I mean, imagine if, and this is why I think clean creatives, our buddies over there are doing some great stuff is because they're also recognizing the responsibility and the role of people in the advertising world. And they're saying, hey, y'all, like, instead of advertising this shit that's driving us into this mess, let's maybe stop working with those companies and maybe use our talents elsewhere where it's needed, you know? So again, like, all cre creatives in whatever field like let's support those that are actually doing the good work because if their work fails because they don't get the, the the right marketing their messaging sucks their branding's off whatever that might be then then it's all then we all fail it's all it's all done mm -hmm. <laughs> so just it's a no-brainer to just you know support them and, and yeah so I don't know I, I think it's um let's I don't know. I'm, I'm excited to kick off this project. I'm excited to hear what my students have to say and evolve it too. You know, it's, it's a, it's going to be a, an evolving project. Um, but yeah, more solutions, man. Yeah. So There's, speaking of more solutions, can you think of another example from the documentary? Um, Putting you on the spot here. Yeah. I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to answer it this way because it's also in the document. It's actually one of the five that they touched upon it was marine permaculture mm -hmm. kelp farms you know and you and i've talked about this um, kelp for, farms seagrass uh, apparently there's a whole bunch of plants yeah that um grow what like not deep in the ocean but like alongside the coast right yeah yeah, yeah. and I uh, mean, they can also be put in way off in the deep ocean okay uh, with, with these like upside down like hangers you know Oh yeah, I, I've uh, pulled a really cool picture of one of those mm -hmm. um, just because it looks so, it has that look of being like nature-based high-tech. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is, yeah. It's kind of solar punk and cool, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, so speaking of that and speaking of jobs and transitioning, so there's a part in there where it talks about, you know, imagine all the, the, um, the fishers, the people that, you know, are in the fisher fishing industry, people. fisher people, you know, <laughs> fish, lobster, whatever, um, because their current ecosystem, or I'm sorry, their current industry is, it's, it's getting bad. It's, you know, fish are dying off. There's lots of fish in, fish in the sea. And, um, and also people are moving more towards a plant-based diet. So at some point they're going to have to make a decision. Where do I go? I have a certain skill. Um, I would like to kind of continue to use those skills. And so, yeah, why not? become a kelp farmer you know mm. you're you're still on the water um you're probably you know you're still driving a boat you know and so um imagine a whole new industry and and the, the side note with kelp farming specifically is that it is a huge industry outside of the U.S. so it's not as if kelp farming is not a thing elsewhere it's just the U.S. it's just not a thing here and yeah we um, never I never hear about it. I don't even know like on a very basic science level uh, I understand that 
all plants mm -hmm. take carbon dioxide out of the air and sequester it into the ground where they're growing or into themselves as energy to create yeah. leaves or whatever they grow, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think as far as I know, the really cool thing about sea grass and kelp and, and stuff like that is since it grows underwater, it can be planted or farmed in places where we're not using that land already, yeah. you know, to grow food or whatever. Yeah. And I also don't know if this is true. Tell me if you know, um, but a lot of aqua plants grow a lot faster than plants on land or something oh, totally. like that. Yeah. So kelp is one of the fastest growing plants and there's the uh, like the brown leaf kelp that was featured in the 2040 documentary. It grows a meter a day. Wow. And that's, you know, you know all carbon dioxide that it's exactly. pulling into itself so to build itself. It's, it's one of the best uh, sequestration plants, if I said that right, cool. uh, along with, along with bamboo, which I'm a fan of. Um, it grows really fast. It can provide thousands of resources, um, products, I should say, just like hemp, which is another Thing that I'm a fan of. So yeah. kelp can be used for food, cosmetics, plastics, fuels, whatever. And um, if we, and then if we decide not to pull it up and, and, you know, transform it into whatever, we can sink it. It's a carbon sink. Mm -hmm. like it literally drops to the ocean because if you let it go and grow and just collect all that, um, it'll, it'll become so heavy mm -hmm. that it'll just sink and it will, it won't, it'll, it'll, the carbon will stay in there. It won't ever get re-released. So therefore just stay at the bottom of the ocean. So like, even if the leaves or whatever die and it falls off and decomposes and dies, it still stays at the bottom of the ocean, right? It, the whole thing, I mean, it's all connected. It wouldn't fall mm -hmm. off. It's just mm -hmm. all one piece. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, cause it's not like, let's compare this to um, even, even hemp, but let's start with comparing it to planting a tree or like planting trees. Like there's so many people on the right who are like Trumpers. I guess Trump was a proponent of this trillion tree planting idea and mm -hmm. yeah. would say at his rallies or whatever that, you know, climate is, if he even acknowledged that climate is a problem at all, he was like, it's not a problem. We just need to plant a trillion trees and it would be yeah. solved, which is false. Um, that's not enough trees to, to solve the problem. <laughs> um, well, and trees aren't the only way of solving it. It's, well, yeah, you know. and trees, here's the thing with trees. Trees grow really slowly. <laughs> so it might take 30 to 60 to 100 years for a tree to reach its full capacity of carbon having been sequestered. You know, maturity is when it's at its full capacity. Yeah. And then we have to keep that tree alive. So we're having a huge problem with forest fires right now. Yeah. So um, even offset programs and stuff like that, where people are paying into funds that are planting forests, um, a lot of that money that we have used to offset pollution and further emissions is being burned in these wildfires. So how does that make any sense? It right. doesn't. Spoiler. Right, right. And, you know, the other thing about trees, too, when people make the, you know, I know that there's a lot of hate, um, people hating on the um, carbon removal industry, like, oh, just, have you ever heard of trees? Right, right. It's like, so everything that you listed on top of, you know, are we planting the right trees in the right location? Are we tending to those trees? Um, you know, what happens if there's drought? Those trees are not going to survive. Yeah. You know? And so, so like I think any land-based agriculture has that risk. Mm -hmm. um, you have to basically guard that tree for the rest of your life or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, but, like, but it's, yeah, it's going to burn or somebody's going to cut it up because or it's someone cuts it up. Yeah. more valuable to sell a tree as wood than it is to leave it in the ground. Right. Right. So, you know, yes, we need more trees. And, and I think one of the, the main reasons why we should say we need more trees is that it creates, if done well, it, cr it creates a thriving ecosystem around. Yeah, the trees as well. and that's so the that's biggest the other thing, thing about trees is they are homes to yeah. so many other 
animals that are made of carbon too. That can then, you know, rebalance that ecosystem. But that's the other cool thing about kelp too. It also has that same quality. So nice. if you put kelp forests together, you have marine life coming back. You have oysters and crustaceans and stuff clinging on to, you know, the little kelp forest down there. So, so yeah, you start to build that ecosystem of other living beings around it. And, but the cool thing about kelp is that it's underwater. We don't, I mean, we can implement thousands of farms right now and it wouldn't even obstruct our day-to-day -day lives. Exactly. There's no <laughs> one know? that's like going to try and cut it down. It's not going to fall uh, prey to wildfires, forest fires. Um, unless there's some crazy kind of ocean, underwater ocean fire I don't know about. <laughs> yeah, right. But yeah, no, you mentioned crustaceans. Did everybody know that crustaceans are made out of shells? You know, the, the shells that they make are made out of carbon too. So crustaceans are cool. Like everything is cool. Anyway. Yeah. So I don't know. I, again, it's like, wow. And I've been joking with my students this semester, you know, when I'm just like, you know, because sometimes we do have these hard conversations and sometimes the energy of the class during certain parts of the lecture or the discussion can get pretty, pretty low because we are talking about some heavy shit. Yeah. Um, and I always make the, the, the joke, you know, man, sometimes it gets so hard. I don't want to do this anymore. I just want to go and be a kelp farmer now, you know, like nice. that's kind of my thing. And, and I don't know, it's just, it's just like, how do we spread these solutions so that everyone can can understand that this is a potential career change because people change careers all the time. It's not a new thing. Um, and so if they don't know that this could be a thing that they can do, and it's a lot of these new industries are going to have a lot of transferable skills. So why not? Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, question in the chat. Rachel asks, what do you think about carbon sequestering devices for individuals? Like suction fan backpacks? Yeah, what does it look like? She said she saw an Instagram <laughs> ad for one. Oh, I see. Well, um, wasn't that one of the prompts? We have this design, climate design for fun circle in our Mighty Network um, where we have a you know, fun prompt once every two weeks. Mm -hmm. And I got really busy, so I hadn't checked, but I think one of the prompts was design a wearable carbon sequestration device. Isn't that one of the prompts? Something like that, yeah. Something like that. Well, okay, so here's what I know about um, mechanical carbon sequestra sequestration. Now it's my turn to not be able to talk. Um, so I will post a link to climbworks.com slash orca in the chat. If you go to that um, link, it's the new facility that Climbworks announced very recently. Um, you know, they had a vision for a long time to scale this idea of sucking carbon dioxide out of the air and turning it into a solid or liquid that you can then um, make into stuff and sequester it. So uh, in on this is on the 8th of September, so not very long ago, they launched Orca, which is the now largest climate positive direct air capture and storage plant. So um, just like look at the image that's there. It looks like, uh, I don't know, like a semi truck of fans or something and kind of pipes and stuff. And I believe the um, capacity is it can pull 4,000 tons of carbon from the atmosphere and store it underground in geological storage. Now, is that, I don't know how, ma how many is that a year? times, is that a year? Um, but like, we have to understand the scale that we're talking about here. So if it takes a semi truck to be able to pull down 4,000 tons of carbon, um, what can we do with a wearable device? I mean, granted in what, 1950 something, that semi truck is about the size of what a computer is right. or was back then. And now we have phones in our pockets. So yeah, yeah. yes, you know, engineering and innovation and efficiency can make these things much, you know, smaller and more, have more capacity. 
um, I just, you know, 4,000 tons of carbon dioxide, by the way, we need to be thinking about billions of tons. Mm -hmm. So if that's a year, it doesn't actually say, I'm going to have to like do my research and like, because if it's 4,000 tons a year, like what is, what is even a billion minus 4,000? Like it, yeah. barely even makes a dent well that's right? why they that's why this solution, per year yes it's per year we need a lot of them so imagine yeah. all the, the land all the open land so we got to find that land exactly and can we build these solutions vertically because it'll take up less of a footprint or under um, the ocean or something <laughs> right, that's right. why kelp farming actually makes a lot that's, of sense i mean what is it 80 percent of the planet is covered by ocean like yeah what? We're not using the surface of it, but maybe, you know, a boat here and there. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, I mean, I'm not saying that this um, 4,000 tons of carbon in one semi-truck machine shouldn't be pursued because mm -hmm. pursuing it is what allows the technology to advance and um, yeah. it will it will get smaller, it will get more energy efficient, it will be able to suck up more carbon dioxide as we work on it. Um, you know, the... The thing about time and innovation isn't just that time goes by and, and suddenly magic happens and it's better. It's no, it's like, as we work on it, you know, we discover new things and figure out new things and invent new things. Um, so the semi truck that takes 4,000 tons has to exist right now. If we want a wearable device, that's going to take 4 billion tons of, I don't know, um, but yeah, no, the other thing about the wearable device thing is if our goal is to have wearable devices, um, that is incentive or motivation for these engineers to find ways to make it smaller and more efficient and wearable. So even if it only takes 4,000 tons of carbon out of the air a year and 1 billion people were wearing one, that's yeah. like a, isn't that yeah. like a Buddhist proverb or something? Right, right. Uh, I was supposed to chant this mantra a million times. So that I just had every cell in my body chant it once. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I love that vision, you know, these, you know, 1 billion, 2 billion, I mean, 2050, you know, estimated 9 billion people on the planet. You yeah. Know? So if we take a ninth of that and have people wear and you know i would love to see it you know integrated in a seamless way in our everyday lives you yeah know, the fabric of our clothes <clears throat> what if we're just walking around in our <clears throat> with our jacket yeah have it be my watch is but the jacket is the the sequestration device or your watch yeah. you what know? if my so, watch could be powered by the carbon dioxide it's falling out of the air yeah exactly you know or it's a it's Somehow. under the hood of your electric vehicle because the hood doesn't have an engine it's just more space so you can have a capture device at the front of your car um or in the back or whatever like so yeah i think you're right i think the computer analogy is important um and then i think it goes along the lines of just the argument of well that's never been done before you know right. it's like well no shit dude you that's know? why like, we have to do it yeah and like, so <laughs> can you imagine an engineer in 1950 when he's working with his colleagues on the computer in a huge warehouse right and he goes uh no man it would be great to like put this in your pocket one day and all of his colleagues go dude that'll never what? happen this is it this is yeah. it this is, this all is it our, this is the coolest thing we can ever this is invent the coolest thing we can do no dude you're going to continue to innovate and so and like i'm thinking of people who say oh those direct air capture machines are so big and energy inefficient it's, it's a pipe dream like forget about it and i'm like people probably said that about the computer back in the 50s yeah. and so if we if we just keep working on it no doubt this shit's going to get easier cheaper faster better come on y'all yeah. like do you not understand the advances in science or technology in other ways like computers and phones and shit like the fact that we can put a put people on a can tube inside of a can tube and put them in the air like it's just new and when things are new it's gonna look ugly and bulky and you know it might yeah. break once or twice but we're gonna get better at it so and i think it just goes to show that and i think this is another great piece in the 2040 documentary is that it's going to take all solutions working simultaneously 
you know, so don't hate on any one solution. Just find a solution that is you're drawn to and just put your energy in that and yeah. let someone else do the direct air capture. If, a wearable, if a wearable direct air capture device is what you want, then like focus yeah, on getting a billion people to, to wear one. Yeah. Create that. How do you industry. make it? How do you make it so desirable mm -hmm. that a billion people, you know, not only um, small enough and efficient enough and um, affordable enough, mm -hmm. but desirable yeah. enough that a yeah. billion people will do it so that gets us back to the rihanna fashion show yeah exactly yeah Boom. and you know and then you know to push that a bit more to to make it more personal to that person like well then get your then get your cousin who's an accountant at a bullshit company to quit their job and work for your industry or your company because we need people that are even outside of design to create that those new industries so like, again, we can talk about green jobs, but no one's talking about how to actually get there and how to motivate people to transition from those not green jobs to those green jobs. And we need to show that future. We need to imagine it, you know, your background again. It's like, I want to live in that world, you know? Like, if you tell me there's a job waiting for me in that little thing behind you, Sarah, I'm, gonna, I'm like, okay, I'm down. Yeah. Where, where, where do I sign up? You know? Like, I can just... Um get transported around in a hot air balloon instead of oh my god i'm so done with airports i don't ever want to deal with an airport again oh my god it's so gross there's so many people breathing the same air um yeah it's just ew um what else so speaking of solutions Something that you might not know about is um, there's a Kickstarter. It's been funded. Um, somebody that Mark's been talking to has created a solutions board game. Mm -hmm. So that's a really fun way, I think, to, and you ordered us some, right? You ordered us a couple? I did. I contributed. Um, nice. We contributed to the um, Kickstarter yes. as a Excellent. studio. Excellent. So, yeah. So it's a really cool way to get your family involved in talking about climate solutions. It's, you know, you win points and there's a whole video on it on their Kickstarter. I need to like look up the link. So Mark, you talk about it while I look it up. Yeah, it's um, it's solutionsthegame.com, solutionsthegame.com. And cool. yeah, they are, um, they're focusing on the, again, Project Drawdown Solutions. I think they're an official partner yeah, they were working with the organization to yeah. make sure that the solutions that they talk about in the game are scientifically valid and right. and to rate it based on the, the criteria that drawdowns used to rate it. Yeah, and again, it's just another great example of turning these solutions into something engaging and fun so that you know all of these people, young and old, who are playing this game can learn about this stuff and go, huh. I didn't, I'm going to look into that myself or, huh, let me, let me, let me um, tell so-and-so about this. He might be interested, you know, like it's another way of having that conversation. What we were talking about last week with, um, with the previous uh, um, stream. Yeah. I mean, more of this, please, you know, to mm -hmm. make it fun and enjoyable. Why would you like, who would pass this up? Yes, exactly. Uh, speaking of Paul Hawken, he's coming out with another book. Um, on building a regenerative world. Uh, he's making the podcast interview circuit now and I heard him on a podcast, it's really good. Um, I'm trying to see if I have the tab in a one tab somewhere, but maybe I don't. So I'll just have to do a search on Paul Hawken regenerative book to get the title of it. Yeah, I would love to partner up with Drawdown. I've been meaning to to reach out now that we've you know kind of starting to build up something. Um, it'd be great to collaborate on a project together with our community. Yeah, uh, regeneration.org looks like. Um, so it by the way that he was talking about it in the podcast I listened to it sort of sounded to me like Paul has moved on from drawdown and is now on to project regeneration, which is a pretty cool um, mindset shift. If you think about it too, where drawdown was really about um, 
what's the most effective way to draw carbon dioxide out of the air and permanently keep it out of the air, right? Um, which is awesome and was like really mind opening for a lot of people, especially in the environmental activism movement. I think a lot of people were starting to feel, uh, you know, especially during the Trump presidency that like, this is kind of hopeless and we're screwed. And Drawdown was, you know, really a breath of fresh air where it's like just really different ways of thinking about solutions and things that everyone was so focused on just ending the fossil fuel industry, which we still need to do. But um, other ways that, you know, even if we are over our carbon budget, um, there are ways that don't rely on semi-truck sized fans to suck the carbon dioxide out of the air. Like that was something that needed to be said for people to just get their energy revitalized and get back into it. But now um, with regeneration, it seems like it's not so much about just carbon dioxide, but um, it's, there's a phrase or a term that I heard on Twitter or maybe in a book called multi-solving mm -hmm. um, where regeneration takes the idea of taking carbon dioxide out of the air and then it takes it further and says, you know, you can do that while also growing food or increasing biodiversity or making living conditions better for people. And um, that's really where we need to be going. So it's, it's less of a laser focused, narrow-minded lens on just that one slice of the puzzle. Did I just mix metaphors there? Um, <laughs> and much more about like, you know, people say that we need systems change all the time, but this is more about like, well, what does that mean? What is that change? Yeah. What is that yeah. new system? Let's define it. Let's talk about it. Let's visualize it and let's get people excited about it. Yeah. Cause that's part of that vision, you know, and that's the thing we can't build something that we don't know what it looks like. Yeah, and that idea. politicians are always going to lag behind innovation. Oh, yeah, totally. I guess is my point. And so as, you know, even if our design expertise is only visualizing things only rather than like industrial design and like engineering and inventing and creating things, the visualization is the hardest part, yo. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that is something that brings all designers together is we can visualize things that don't exist yet. Mm -hmm. And politicians can't do that. They're, they have shown, you know, since time immemorial that they cannot do that. Yeah. And so it's going to take us, you know, visionary creative thinkers to just start to think into things that don't exist yet. And let's start making them a reality. What would that look like? And then, you know, uh, inventors and innovators and engineers step in and be like, oh yeah, I actually know how to do that now that I'm looking at it, right? And, and then the once it exists, mm -hmm. you know, it can become policy. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the thing is too, like, you know, it's, I don't want someone to go, oh, well, but I don't know all the answers to envision that future. It's like, you don't exactly. have to. You know, like, let's figure this out together. Like, again, that your Zoom background image, you know, if, if someone did visualize that and, and if it seemed viable and, and feasible and desirable, you know, they'd be like, okay, well, let's get to work. So they're going to deconstruct it to figure yeah. out like the inner workings of it. And you don't have to know all those answers, you know. Yeah, that's the thing too. Is, um, I've been on a lot of creative projects, like creating an app, creating a website, creating a book creating a presentation, creating an event. Um, and the act of creating it is how you figure it out. Yeah. You know? And I think people have this idea. I think Steve Jobs probably gave us this idea that like you just sort of wave your hands and poop out an iPhone that's like complete and perfect and amazing. But how different is our what are we on like iPhone 15 now from that first one? It's really innovation and iteration that go hand in hand. And so, you know, you come up with the ideas, 
you come up with the vision and then you start drawing it out on paper and you start thinking about how could I get this done and who do I need to talk to? And then they have some ideas and they have mm-hmm. something that's similar and bring in their experience and then they know somebody and then, they, you know, yeah. 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 And it's through that process, like your first drawing, this is one thing that I teach a lot is that first drawing, a lot of people put a lot of pressure on themselves to make that first idea perfect or something Mm -hmm. but like you just need enough to get people talking because it's always going to be wrong in some way or another Mm -hmm. um and so you just need to get like a cocktail napkin out and a sharpie and get some sketching down and that starts the conversation and that's what we need desperately it's in this case it's you know uh quantity over quality Absolutely. You know, just barf out everything and get something out and you'll probably trash things right off the bat. You'll probably combine things, get rid of things, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but if we all have that kind of uh, stage fright and if we all collectively have that stage fright and we don't feel as if our idea is good enough or if it is you know, uh, uh, feasible, then you could be sitting on a great idea, a great solution. You know? Yeah. And even and, if it's not feasible, we're going to talk about it and figure out a way that true. Yeah. You know, figure out a version of it that is. Yeah. 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 So um, yeah. And I think with, with my students, you know, they don't have a whole lot of practice or maybe other faculty members in my, in certain departments don't teach, um, you know, create multiple iterations and like, you know, do this 50 times, hundred times, you know, they tend to just go to the, the first idea, the first sketch, the first design and stick with it. Make them and, do an um, eight by eight or something. Oh, no, I'm, oh, don't worry. I'm definitely going to push them. <laughs> um, I don't play that game. And, uh, and so, yeah, so I think we need to, as designers, get comfortable with that as well. I think, you know, even some seasoned professionals, you know, are like, oh, I'm so good. I can, I'll just do something and it'll be amazing right off the bat. It's like, okay, cool. But, you know, um, how is that approach to your creativity or that mindset to your design? Is that really benefiting you? Are you not exploring uncharted territories? Are you staying in your comfort zone? Are you only going by, you know, best practices that you've discovered? Um, push yourself. You know, my other class, I teach a, a short portfolio class and we talked about creativity and how is this skill? It's a muscle. You got to train it and, um, you know, avoid the complacency of creativity when it comes to your work, because it is comfortable to just go into your old bag of tricks and apply the same shit to different projects. And, you know, sure, but are you, are you overlooking um, unexpected solutions? Are you not exploring uncharted territories that might drive better results, more creativity, better innovation? So yeah, I think it's also a skill too that designers, especially professional designers tend to forget. It's like, you know, you have to, just like the gym, just like eating healthy, you have to work on your creativity. You have to keep it going so that you can produce even better stuff, but more importantly, create better stuff for your, for your clients, the people that you're working with, because those are the ones that are bringing all this other, all these other elements to your creativity to mash them all together to create that future world that's on your Zoom background. You know? Yeah, you know, I started searching for solar punk um, fantasy cities and airships after reading Ministry for the Future mm-hmm. by Kim Stanley Robinson. And there's an airship, I think it's something similar to a hot air balloon, I don't even know. But um, I wanted to know what the heck an airship might even look like. And there's so many different designs that these fantasy illustrators and artists have published to DeviantArt or put on Pinterest or whatever. And Mm -hmm. so I just started, I started a private board of just airships images. And uh, yeah, it just makes me feel really good that like things can be invented that we don't even know yet. You know? Yeah, I mean, look at Jules Verne. He was talking about submarines and sea exploration and all that stuff before that was even an idea. You Same know, with Leonardo can... da Vinci. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I think we can really credit those who create these these um, fantasy worlds in many yeah. ways because it gives other people who are maybe more skilled in in the areas in which they can actually. Um, you know, create those things that gives them inspiration. Like, oh yeah, that would be cool to fly in or to go underwater in. Hmm. With my engineering background, let me see how I can do that. And then boom, done. You got a fucking submarine. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, like that's how this shit works. Yep. Brilliant.
So it's the top of the hour. Um, anything else you wanted to talk about while we were talking about solutions, Mark? Um, no, I mean, I'm sure we'll talk more about this stuff, but I'm, I'm excited for the class. It's going to be uh, interesting. So yeah, I'll keep you posted. I'll, I'll share some updates throughout the rest of the semester. Yeah, I'm curious to hear, you know, what kinds of questions come up or what kinds of projects people start yeah. talking about. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thanks for watching. Let's go out there and raise some hell.